Okay, so that was my very first attempt at high-speed photography of lightning. And it was done using this high-speed camera. And I'm going to explain to you a bit about this camera first, and then I'm going to show you what you can do with some image processing on that lightning footage, because you can do some pretty awesome stuff with that. Um, so this is my high-speed camera, which was not cheap. This was $15,000, maybe about twenty dollars once you start including all the taxes and the such like. But it will film up to a million frames per second, which is in principle enough to film the speed of light, which is something that I've had on the cards for some time because, you know, you do the little back of an envelope calculations and you work out, eh, this is actually possible. Um, so the general experiment you need is you need lasers. This is just a infrared thermometer, but it's got a laser on it. So what you need to do is you essentially have the camera pointing away, you have a beam splitter in the front somewhere, and so you, you see the, the, the reflection off the beam splitter essentially instantaneously. Then you need a mirror about a kilometre or so away reflecting back at you. And then you should see a few millionths of a second later the laser light coming back from the reflected mirror, which would actually, I think, be really cool. I mean, you hear this stuff that, uh, you know, light takes time to travel, but until you've actually seen it, um, you know, actually recorded, it, it's, it's not quite the same. I mean, it's not, look, the sound is very easy to do like this. You just get someone, you know, 300 meters away and you watch them clap and you hear it, the sound arrive like a second or so later or you just shout and you hear the echo coming back. Very easy to do that with sound. Much harder to do it with light. So that's, you know, I've, I've been trying to move away from, how shall I say, um, unproductive things. Um, and yeah, yeah, I think that would be a really cool thing to do, would be to actually just directly measure the speed of light. Now the downside is, of course, that with these very high-speed cameras, as the, the frame rate goes up, the resolution goes down. By the time you're up to a million frames per second, I think you're down to eight pixels by a hundred or so. So you're not going to get much in the way of an image here, but you will be able to actually measure the speed of light. So all a high-speed camera is in essentially is. Let's see if we can open this up. There is a very high-speed sensor in there. Um, and that essentially just reads to memory. So a lot of high-speed photography is about getting enough light to create an image in a very short period of time. Because obviously, if I'm reading my pixels at a million frames per second, but I'm only getting a photon every thousandth of a second, then my pixels are spending 999 parts of a thousand doing nothing, just essentially reading blank. So as obviously a waste of time. You need to get enough light onto your subject material, which is why a lot of high-speed photography is about really bright lights. Sunlight's pretty good as it turns out. Uh, if you want to record something small, you need lots of photons on it so you can get really high frame rates. Um, now, uh, when I got this, uh, it was mostly to continue the, the research on the sodium potassium uh, water explosions. Uh, which were originally done with a camera much like this. This is actually somewhat better than the ones the one that we did the original research with. And that's where we found out that the very early stages of this metal water reaction are driven by this Coulombic explosion, which is why sodium actually explodes in water, because it shouldn't really. You know, if you think about it, you've got your sodium and your water, and they can only react on the interface. And that generates sodium hydroxide and hydrogen, which in principle moves your reagents apart. It should be a self-limiting reaction. <clears throat> Yet, once you look at it with one of these guys, you find that it explodes in about one ten thousandth of a second. So yeah, um, I want to do a load more stuff on that. And so most of my lenses were geared up to sort of filming small stuff, you know, relatively narrow angles, fast lenses, that sort of thing. Um, but 
then this thunderstorm comes over and it's like, hmm. <clears throat> Lightning is potentially a very good subject for a high-speed camera because it puts off lots of light. Um, but I'd never done it before. And whenever you do something for the first time, it rarely comes together. And also there's this element of risk. I mean, sure, you can plug it into a surge protector and all the such like, um, but fundamentally, usually in a thunderstorm, you unplug your sensitive electronics. Um, so there is an element of risk to it. But hell, if you want, sometimes if you want the good stuff, you've got to take risks. So, um, but it turns out my real bit problem was I didn't have a wide enough angle lens to really do this. So I, it, this is my widest angle lens. It's like 50 millimeters, you know, that sort of field of view. Um, now, it turns out actually recording a lightning strike isn't actually that difficult because what these things do is they continuously write to memory. So they'll record what the camera has seen for the last, I don't know, five seconds or something. And then when you push a button, it freezes that memory and then you can go watch it at your leisure and record what you want. So all you have to do is point the camera at the sky and hope there is a lightning strike that goes across in front of the camera. Then you have to push the button and go through and actually find the lightning strike. Now, even though this camera will, like I, like I was saying, um, I didn't really have a good idea of what I was doing here. So initially I had the camera on a relatively low frame rate of about mm, a thousand frames per second and later moved up to uh, uh, 3,000 frames per second. Yeah, this thing will quite happily go up to 20,000 frames per second at a sensible resolution. But, you know, you need the lightning strike in the right place and the right... This lens really isn't well set up for it. So later, I expect to be able to do much better. So anyway, I've got a couple of good lightning strikes in there. And... They're absolutely fascinating when you look at them, you know, going through it frame by frame and when you can actually enhance the image with the image processing. Now, like I said, this is, this is an essay in the art. I think I can do much, much better than this. Um, so I've already ordered the wide angle lens and now all I really need is another decent thunderstorm. But in the meantime, I'm gonna show you some of the absolutely awesome stuff that you can get by going through this frame by frame. Right, so this is the analysis software. Uh, here I have my lightning strike, and here I have my frame numbers. They're a thousandth of a second per frame. So I've got about uh, 300 frames here, give or take. Um, and it's looping, uh, but it's fairly dark. So what I'm gonna do, first of all, is I'm gonna brighten this up. Let's, let, let's pause it somewhere where it's in the middle where we can actually see what the hell's going on about there somewhere. So we're on that nice and bright. So let's have the gain way up high, right? Because we're actually interested. We're not so interested in um, saturation. It's not going to make any difference. Bright as well. Okay, let's give that a go. So, from the beginning, let's watch, just watch it through again. Right. So, the first thing that you notice is that there's this strike that comes out to the right-hand side. There's actually a, a faint lightning strike that you can see comes out this side, and it's very fast, very early. There it goes. One, two, three. All right, propagates all the way across. And then this really gets going. Now, I want you to pay attention. So it's one thousandth of a second between frames. Now, as you watch the lightning go across the sky, what you'll notice is the leader is actually comparatively hot and then it gets cool behind the leader. And it does that all the way as it goes across. Um, so it's only ever the, the front bit that's actually hot until it actually finds a big area of charge. I mean, you see it's, it's much hotter at the front than it is on the tail. And then when it gets to some nice area, it goes boom. But look, 
it, it's only gone halfway down in one frame and then it goes all the way down and then it goes boom again and you even get these little little bits on the side here I've never I don't know what the hell that's all about so I've actually sort of turned that down a bit um, So going forwards, boom, and then you just get these little little side bits. Watch, watch around here. There'll be a little side guy, and they only last like one frame. Yeah, like this guy here. And then it just slowly fades. And that's basically it. Now, oh, once again, if you just go out this side, boom. But it, it, it's incredible watching it propagate across the sky like that, frame by frame. Watching it snake and why it forks. I don't know. I really not got a good idea what's going on here. And then, boom. It's, and you get two pulses and these little bits that spray off the side for no apparent reason. Right, cool. So that's that one. Now, it turns out I actually had two, uh, I got two lightning strikes. And this is the second one. Now this one I was actually filming much faster. So this was being filmed at 3000 frames per second. But the thing you'll notice about this one is when I play it, is it's much faster. Right, that's basically the whole thing. So this goes to the ground, right, this lightning strike. So I'm playing backwards now. And boom. But the interesting thing is you'll see, right, so let me, First of all, get that all brightened up. All right, so let's make it nice and bright. That's a bit too much. Yeah. I don't care too much about getting the color right here. Okay, not a loom. So, what you'll notice here is the lightning actually comes up from the ground. Boom. Just like that. That's one three thousandth of a second. It shoots up from the ground. And again, you see it propagates, but this one's propagating much faster than the one that was just in the clouds. And then it cools down. So this one cools down almost instantly. And this one stays hot for some reason. I don't know why. Let's go backwards again, and forwards, boom, so that's incredible, one frame, it so jumps up from the ground to the sky, and that's it. Now there's one other really cool thing that I want to show you here, um, which sort of probably would go by unnoticed by most people. Um, so I'm just going to play this one again. And look down here, and you'll notice that all the street lights are flickering. That's the 50 hertz of the the, um, the mains. The mains pulses at 50 hertz. And the reason they're probably not in sync is because they're fed from different substations. So if we actually take a look at these guys and go through it frame by frame... You see that some of them are clearly in sync, right? Three of them are clearly in sync, and one of them is not. Yeah? So one of these days, I'm just going to... Yeah, I, I've done it before. You point the high-speed camera at the city, and you watch the different pulses over different parts of the city. So it's just kind of fun that down here, you've got the pulses of the human electricity 
and then up in the sky you've got the pulses of the natural electricity. Boom. Go away. Cool, eh?